Everyone and welcome to The Year Was, a podcast all about today. I'm your host Michael Montalvo and together we take the history train back in time once again to discover what makes today truly unique. Together we continue to gather random nuggets of trivia to make you sound smart or just drop that little fact that makes others stop and say, hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? In this episode, we examine the events that occurred today, September 25th. Now, a quick note before we start. The year was 1934, and on this day, previous podcast topic, Lou Gehrig, played his 1,500th consecutive game. So congratulations to Lou Gehrig. I really don't have too much small talk today, so I'm just going to go ahead and get into this episode. The year was 1926, and on this day, Henry Ford issued a five-day, 40-hour work week for his employees, or an eight-hour work day. I think most of us are at least aware of Henry Ford, but let's talk a bit about him. To bring it down to its simplest form, Henry Ford made cars. Born July 30th, 1863 in Michigan, about eight miles west of Detroit, he attended a one-room school when not helping his father harvest on the family farm. At age 13, he was gifted a pocket watch from his father, which, according to the article I read, he promptly took apart and reassembled, and this ability impressed friends and neighbors so much that he was soon repairing many of their own timepieces. He only stayed in school for about eight years, and at age 16, walked to Detroit to find work in the machine shops of the city. He would take on an apprenticeship as a machinist at a shipbuilding firm, and in the years that followed, he learned to operate and service steam engines and study bookkeeping. After three years of this, he came into contact with the internal combustion engine for the first time, and that's when he finally returned to his family's farm, but he still worked part-time for the Westinghouse Engine Company, as well as tinkering in his own home shop. He actually built a tractor that used a mowing machine chassis and a homemade steam engine for power. And that's impressive. Most impressive. After nine years back home, he returned to Detroit just not before meeting and marrying Clara Ayla Bryant in 1888. He was made chief engineer at the... Detroit Edison Company plant responsible for monitoring the city's electric service 24 hours a day. Because of this, he lacked any real form of regular hours, and he was able to experiment. Having determined to build a gasoline-powered vehicle, he did just that by the end of 1893. By 1896, he had completed his horse's carriage, the quadricycle, named for the fact that the chassis was mounted on top of bicycle tires. That same year, he met with Edison and presented him with plans for an automobile, and he was encouraged by Edison to build a second, better model. By this time, others had built self-powered vehicles and had done so before Ford, but they had all held on to their inventions. Ford didn't. He sold his to finance work on a second, and then a third, and so on, and so on. Over the next seven years, he met with bankers, and in 1889, the Detroit Automobile Company, later renamed to the Henry Ford Company, was born. Only nine years later, in 1898, he was awarded his first patent for a carburetor. Here's where it gets crazy. His backers wanted him to build a passenger car to put onto the market, but Ford just wanted to make improvements on his original design, continuously saying it's not ready for customers. He actually built the 999 race car driven by Barney Oldfield and set speed records. But in 1902, he left the Henry Ford Company, which would become the Cadillac Motor Company after a retool. And finally, in 1903, Ford was ready to market an automobile. Ford Motor Company was born out of $28,000 in cash put up by regular people, and it was a success from the beginning. Probably the most famous Ford automobile, the Model T, became the first car to be affordable, pun intended. 
For most Americans, this was an affordable car and was manufactured from 1906 to 1927, which brings us to the workers' conditions. Eight-hour workdays were not a new thing. In 1898, the United Mine Workers won the right to an eight-hour workday, and by 1905, it was common practice in printing. At Ford Motor Company, they were only producing 25 cars a day, and at the time, it took them 12 hours, 13 minutes per car. This was all during a 16-hour shift. In 1913, he introduced the assembly line that reduced the cost of the Model T as well as the time it took to assemble. By assigning specialized tasks to workers, automobiles could now be built in as little as 2 hours and 30 minutes. Workers found this type of work monotonous though and exhausting, and turnover was so high that for every one man required, they actually hired 10. To reduce this turnover, in 1914, Ford increased wages by nearly $3. They shared profits with the workforce, supported immigrants, and then on this day in 1926, decreased the workday from 16 to 8 hours. They now had a 5-day, 40-hour work week, and this news made the news. Ford would say about this, It is high time to rid ourselves of the notion that leisure for workmen is either lost time or a class privilege. Now, obviously, there's more to the history of Ford Motors and Henry Ford, but I think that's going to do it for us today. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find an audio version on your podcast app of choice. And if you like the podcast, or if you don't, leave us a rate and a review. That helps me out and lets me know what direction to keep this going in. And hey, share it with a friend. They might like it too. You can find me at social media and at YouTube at the Apple Cider Club. And as always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme and you for listening. We'll see you next time.